Now, what if you could play a Chupacabra, a Phoenix, or the Boogeyman himself, all without homebrew or changing the mechanics at all? We continue the reflavoring of races across the Indie 5th edition into new options for you and your table, this time with lineages from Ravenloft, Fizzbands, and other supplements that we've missed. Looking at the mechanics that they offer and giving your characters and NPCs a fresh coat of paint and introducing stories not possible before. Hello Acolytes, welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds more unique and stories more impactful. But first, our incredible sponsor for this video, Elementara, now live on Kickstarter. Elementify 5e with a horde of new spells, elemental techniques for martial classes, a unique new world, and much, much more. It is a new, exciting source book that brings elemental manipulation to 5e, transforming the way you build characters and adventures with tons of new elemental options and resources. This book will include an entire elemental magic system, including seven elements of nature, air, spirit, fire, metal, earth, and water with more than 100 new elemental spells, 7 new elemental spell lists, 50 plus techniques for martial classes, tons of lore for a unique world, 25 plus elemental monsters and NPCs, and rules to elementify existing creatures, there is so, so much. Now hurry and back this product before it ends on October 21st, link in the description below. Now let's get back to it. We will explore some options from previous editions, folklore, and more, reflavoring racial stats in the same way Tasha's Cauldron of Everything let us reflavor feats into custom lineages, in some ways giving us better choices for races that weren't previously an option. So let's start with the race that make their home in the mists of the Shadowfell, or should I say lineage? For those that may not know the difference, lineages are what happens to a race after a magical transformation occurs, meaning that they can visibly look like anything, but their original racial features are replaced with the new features because of that transformation. For example, let's look at our first lineage, the Dampir, a race that is commonly the result of a vampiric transformation. Now, of course, you could be a human vampire, sure, but you could also be a tabaxi vampire, a loxodon vampire, a gnoll, a kobold, you get the picture. But let's look at other things that we can reflavor this into, and then we can look at the other lineages. But first we need to look at what the Dampir actually gives us. When you transform into your new lineage from another race, you get to keep your flying, climbing, or swimming speeds as you originally had, as well as your skill proficiencies. Then you get dark vision, lose the need to breathe air, a spider climb ability, and a bite attack that absorbs vitality from your target. But what if this bite attack wasn't sucking blood, but trying to suck out your brain? I mentioned mind flavor of flavors before, but this one might really satisfy your brain eating habits. I mean, either that or you could be some zombie for the same palate. Perhaps you instead absorb dreams as a night hag, or be an ooze-born that inherit the ability to eat memories like the Oblex. Another ooze does like blood though with the slithering tracker and definitely fits the transformation trope. But what if you were absorbing their soul like a penance stare, or happiness like a dementor, or just chunks of flesh off the enemy like a wendigo? But even if we stuck with blood, there are still many options for you to choose from. Be the terrifying Nosferatu, whose teeth would make any rat jealous, or a Sturge if you had a fly speed before you transformed, or a Death Kiss for a similar reason. Or you can take inspiration from scary stories or folklore, like the Chupacabra, a blood-sucking dog-like creature, or the turtle-like Kappa, that both drinks blood and absorbs souls from a very unpalatable place. Don't look it up without parent supervision, at, at least. But if we didn't want to use any of the gory or scary vibes, we can reflavor the attacks you do as a quickened clerical heal for yourself, or adrenaline that boosts your resolve in a fight. But of course, with the Dampier abilities, we can't ignore the Spider Climb, which I had previously stated in another video that no race had, I admit, and technically this is a lineage, so I was still right. But nonetheless, now perfect for your Driders, Tuldreth, and Chateens from Loth and the Drow, or Edder Caps and Carrion Crawlers, both viable monsters. And just in time for your Spelljammer campaigns, the Insectoid Aliens, the Neogi. But next up in the lineage options, we take a look at the Hexblood, a race transformed by fey magic through a deal or interaction with with a hag. You get dark vision, the disguised self, and hex spells, and special tokens like a fingernail or a clump of hair that you can use to send telepathic message or scry. Now it should be obvious that this would make a great hag race itself if you wanted to take on the warted nose and swamp home. There has also been the hag spawn where you are the product of a dad having a weird infatuation and then you were born, but at least you inherited more of your human moral compass. 
I would say in many renditions of the Boogeyman would fit well here too. Could also work with other fey like Darklings or a Nilbog that transforms from a Goblin, or the Gruar from previous editions might also be a fun option as a Children of Loth. Or it could be that you were just touched by the Feywild itself, plainer Fey magic being imbued into you by some magical accident or long exposure. But building these tokens to scry and telecommunicate, they may also just be a good addition to an artificer background if you gave up the hag flavor altogether or a bounty hunter that uses these tokens to track their targets, or possibly some extra classes of divination that you took in school, giving you some party tricks. The third lineage that came with Ravenloft book is the Reborn. This provides the narrative that you were pulled back from the afterlife after death either in the form of an undead creature or a reanimated through a construct. You lose the need to eat, drink, breathe, or sleep. You have resistance and advantage against poisons. You have advantage on death saving throws, and you only need four hours to get a long rest. You also get glimpses of past lives to give you extra D6 on skill checks. Now, strictly being undead brings up a world of possibilities. You could be a ghoul or a ghast if you came about this transformation by worshiping abyssal deities. There's also the mummy that's been preserved, possibly by magical means, or a revenant who must live on until they exact revenge. Or a headless horseman from folklore. You could be a small size and be a topi, but at that point, you might as well just be a zombie baby. Obviously, make sure that you talk about triggers in your sets and zeros, folks. There is also the lesser known mortif, which is actually the child or spawn of one living parent with another half living one, or play your dreams of warm bodies by being a zombie, or be proficient in pottery tools as a ghost or a banshee. Go barbarian and reflavor your rages as going incorporeal, or just use the undead barbarian subclass that I created in my most recent magazine for my Patreon. I'm doing many undead videos this month all about the undead and incorporating it into your games, and this is a physical supplement that you can have for your table. Reflavors of barbarians, vampires, liches, all types of undead, as well as some subclasses to boot. If you wanna support me in that way, you'll get this magazine as well as the previous one from last month, Adventures in Space on my Patreon, or you can just get them on my website, all linked below in the description. But going on, looking for other inspiration, there is also the race of ghost elves from previous editions. If you're familiar with critical role lore, this may also be an alternate option for a hollow one. And just because of undead transformations, this could be what you give a player when they achieve a type of lichdom. But now speaking of the construct side of things, it could also be an alternate option for your Warforged character or other things like a Mechanist Modron or animated armor. Check out the Eberron Races Reflavor video to hear all the ways you can flavor that one because it really fits good here too. Going on for the next race, we will pull from Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. I covered other Dragonborns in the Player's Handbook Race Reflavor video, so check that out. But here we get to explore the Gem Dragonborns. Unlike their chromatic and metallic counterparts, they deal less with elemental damage, but have more options among Force, Radiant, Necrotic, Psychic, or thunder damage as their breath weapons. But they also get resistance to the chosen type, a temporary flight speed, and the ability to speak telepathically. And weirdly, the number one most reflavored race suggested for this is the Shard Mind, an entirely crystalline race originating from the Astral Sea. Also from previous editions, we could reflavor the Dromite or Mayanad from Eberron, who both could cast energy rays or be a Vril, a bat-like goblin that could sonic boom. No need to reflavor damage types here. These breaths or rays could come from a gem-like eye, a gem embedded in your palm, or a laser gun with a crystal inside. If you wanted a fun flavor for your Kalastar or other psionic races, it would be fun to give them a brainwave attack like Professor X. But this brings us to another setting that gives us one single race, Acquisitions Incorporated, giving us the Verdan, a goblin descendant that evolved quickly to overworld cultures and undergoes a harsh mutation as they go through life. Picking this race also gives you the ability to re-roll ones and twos on hit dice during long rests, telepathy, proficiency in the persuasion skill, and advantage on all wisdom and charisma saving throws. This is also a race that grows from a small creature at first level and then a medium creature at fifth level because of its mutations. You could always reflavor this growth as a wish a small creature made to a genie to be big or a request to a warlock patron or surgery with prosthetics or in a large reduced potion that became permanent as an unlikely side effect. Perhaps you're a race that just has a super fast growth rate and you go through puberty and adolescence while you're out adventuring with the party. 
Or perhaps you have chameleon genetics and if your party is mostly medium-sized creatures, your body may just adapt to the same size. And we haven't even touched the psionic parts, but find some great psionic ideas with the Kalastar also in the Eberron video. Next, we look at a couple races from some other single supplements, starting with the Lakatha, which is the closest thing that you can get to playing a fish in D&D. You will have a natural armor and the ability to breathe water. You get proficiency in athletics and perception and advantage on saving throws against all the status effects, charmed, frightened, paralyzed, poisoned, stunned, or being put to sleep. But speaking of fish, why not explore some weird ones that you can look like? Starting with the famous blobfish, we could also take inspiration from a clownfish, anglerfish, the deep sea micropinna, with eyes inside a translucent head, a boxfish, the pretty beta fish, the lionfish, the pufferfish, or the Huma Huma Nuka Nuka Apua Ah fish. And I'm not ashamed to say that I only know that fish from the high school musical song, but as you can see, there's a lot of fun fish to play with. But you can also play with axolotls, platypuses, or mudskippers, all good options. As far as other editions of D&D races go, there are the Thanoi, a humanoid walrus race, which could also open up animals like dolphins, whales, and seals. But there is also the famous Kuatoa, a fish race who literally created gods by just believing in them hard enough. And just to be thorough, this can also be used as alternate features for other races like sea elves, tritons, and water genasi, or other creatures like merfolk or frog folk. But speaking of frog folk, the next race all in their lonesome is the Grung, a poisonous version of our ribbiting friends. They have proficiency in perception, the ability to breathe water, immunity to poison, and a longer jump distance. You also can poison any creature that you touch or touches you, or take some of that poison on you and put it on your weapons to deal more damage. So let's talk about other creatures that poison on contact. Some beetles release a toxin as a response when they feel threatened, and a pufferfish or jellyfish creates a pretty convincing ward. You could look like a small triton with pufferfish or jellyfish-like features. And weirdly, some bird species also have this weird ability to have toxins on their skin, namely the hooded patuhui. And I bet you didn't know that the platypus has toxic spurs on the back of their legs. But this could also be a scorpion or snake-like creature that spits poison as a reaction, or a cone snail that harpoons a poisonous barb into an attacker, or even a blue-ringed octopus that has very famous venomous defenses. If you didn't want it to be a poison damage type, perhaps change the damage type to lightning to be something like an electric eel when touched. Could be fire or acid damage with an alternate genasi character, radiant damage from someone too holy to be touched, or just be a piercing damage with a spiker or bladeling from previous editions. Unfortunately, no one wants to give that a hug. Next, we will look at an alternate race of something that we've covered before, but enough has changed to warrant some new possibilities. Here we have the Variant Tiefling, a tiefling that gets more physical traits from their hellish parentage, and you can cast spells like Vicious Mockery, Charm Person, Enthrall, Burning Hands, and Hellish Rebuke. But you also get cloven hooves and a pair of wings. Now you can really be an imp or an abyssal chicken. In higher level campaigns, maybe even in Amnizu, Arcanaloth, Pit Fiend, or a Baylor might be on the table. It might also be fun to be a horned devil or a spined devil for great aesthetics, if not anything else, or a Varghul for any reason but the aesthetics. This could also be any color of the Abishai, mortals that won favor from Tiamat and turn into devil dragonborn, but at the same time, many dragon kid would benefit from this reflavor. Then we have the Feyri, who are to elves as tieflings are to humans, this coming from old additions. But with flight and fire, this might also make a fantastic phoenix character or a willow wisp. But then again, maybe your fire comes from a jetpack on your back that helps you fly, you getting it from an artificer you commission. Now you may be saying, Riker, what about the nine other tiefling variants, all from a different layer of hell? And you're right, there are a ton of tiefling variants given in the Morden Canis Tome of Foes. Unfortunately, that has been discontinued in 5e, and if I went over each of them, I fear I would repeat myself a lot. But if you do have them, try to reflavor the source of their magic from something else. Instead of a bunch of tieflings getting power from different arch devils, perhaps there are a bunch of giant borns getting their power from different layers of the ordining or Dryadborn getting theirs from different parts of nature like desert or tundra. Perhaps you're from different dragon marked houses from Eberron or studied specifically in certain schools of magic in a wizard college. But whatever you do, keep your mind open to the possibilities and always keep your creative juices flowing by finding what all is possible. 
And if you had other ideas and reflavors that I missed, add them into the comments below. And be sure to check out the rest of the reflavoring videos by clicking on this playlist here. But in the meantime, go out there and spread the good word of D&D and make the world a better place, both on and off the table. See you in the next one.